Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome all of you back to Ohio Exopolitics. I'm your host, Mark Snyder. Going to look at the the great one of Billy's great books. It's called The Might of Thoughts, and I'm going back through it for the third time, trying to wrap my mind around all this incredible information that's in this book. Let me read something here, and this comes from the Future of Mankind site, which is the Billy Meyer Wiki. And it's it's an article entitled, Why is it so, so important for us to learn so much, especially in our current lifetime? It says, just imagine our horrendous knowledge, which for the most part lies unused in the memory of our subconsciousness and in the planetary storage banks under our frequency. I am immensely happy that my predecessor personalities left me a few evolutive evolutive impulses. But if I do not progress in my conscious thinking to the point of being able to use the data, then none of the knowledge will be accessible to me, or it will only trickle through in drops. It namely is not, as you may assume, that we are constantly bombarded with inspirations of our subconsciousness. In fact, something only occurs to us if we work on a topic intensively and do not find what we are looking for in the memory of our sub- in our consciousness. To intercept something internally or externally, a certain sensitivity for non-physical fine-structured substance in the German called Feinstofflichkeit, is often required. Whoever continuously broods over something misses the fine impulses because brooding implies a state of idleness, unproductiveness, or going around in circles or rotating. However, and this is important, whoever has degenerative thoughts and feelings will no doubt reap the corresponding degenerate impulses of his or her predecessor personalities. Everything always has two sides, a positive one and a negative one. Now, this article is talking about our predecessor personalities. And if you're not familiar with the information in the Meyer case, then this may sound strange to you. And if you're not familiar with the idea of reincarnation, you see, every human being has within them a spirit form. It's a little tiny spark of creation, you could call it. It's like a, it's no bigger than the head of a pen, and it sends this energy out through your whole body in a lattice structure. And it's the part of you that remains when your physical body dies. And it takes with it the thoughts and the feelings that you've had in the current lifetime. And it takes those that knowledge over into the spiritual realm in between lifetimes. And that spirit form works with something called 
the overall consciousness block to process the experiences and the knowledge and the feelings that you've had in your most recent lifetime. And it takes those values that have evolutive value and it stores those in your spirit form. And your spirit form is strengthened and it gets more energy and it also puts those memories in your predecessor, in your subconscious. You see, in deep within your subconscious is the memories of your predecessor personality. And that mem- those memories are in our subconscious and in the planetary storage banks under a frequency. We all have our own frequency in the planetary storage banks. And your predecessor personalities should have left you some evolutive impulses. And you can be inspired by impulses that come from your predecessor personalities, as well as signals that come from these planetary storage banks and from the universal storage banks. You see, we intercept these impulses internally or externally, and it requires a certain sensitivity for us to do that. The sensitivity towards the non-physical, fine-structured substance is required. Whoever continuously broods over something, if you're continuously focused too much on something in an unhealthy way, then you will not get these impulses. It cuts you off from the impulses of the planetary storage banks under your frequency and the universal consciousness as well as the impulses from your predecessor personality. So anyway, the book, The Might of Thoughts, is all about the spiritual teachings discussed in the Meyer case. Because the extraterrestrial human beings that have had these conversations with Edward Albert Meyer are at a higher level of involvement uh, than we are. And they understand clearly the fact of reincarnation, and they understand this art and science of learning to control your thoughts. Because your thoughts are a horrendously powerful thing. Correct thinking and knowledge continually brings into Reality, everything that the human being desires. The problem is we bring a lot of things into reality that we do not desire because of brooding thoughts, repeating thoughts, thoughts that come up from our unconscious mind, thoughts that deal with all sorts of unhealthy things, rage and lust and unsatisfaction. You know, unsatisfaction kills off all initiative for striving towards that which is higher. And you fall into that brooding misery that I was talking about. And it stops in initiative. Do you know if you have a circumstance in your life that seems overwhelming, a very, very big challenge, and it seems like so many things have lined up against you, and you're not even sure if you can meet this challenge, And it's really easy to lose your initiative, to fall into unsatisfaction, to become, to go into a state where you're brooding rather than being productive. You know that good thoughts lead to good feelings. And the feelings always follow the thoughts. The feelings are not emotions. Emotions rage upward quickly. The feelings grow like a plant and they grow like a flower, and they respond to your thoughts. You know, after the physical birth, the infant becomes aware and conscious of itself after about three months, and the personality starts to form, and the mentality 
starts to form. And we have thoughts and feelings. And we have unconscious impulses. Now, unfortunately, on the earth today, we have a lot of religion, but very little spiritual teaching that tells us how to deal with the thoughts and the feelings and the impulses that we have. So we need to learn as a child. We we should have been learning as a child, but we 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 weren't. We we have often let our feelings run out of control, our thoughts run out of control, our emotions run out of control, and we drift and we drift and we fall into repeating uncontrolled thoughts that oversaturate us. Uh, Additionally, the human being always feels oversaturated on account of his or her thoughts which overburden him in this regard, resulting in feelings of the same kind, a result of which the psyche is also affected in the same way. Our psyche is the part of our mentality that controls the thoughts and, and the feelings of the material consciousness. You see, we have a a material consciousness and a spiritual consciousness. Now, most people don't realize that we have these two kinds of consciousness. The spiritual consciousness is controlled by something called the gemut. The gemut controls the thoughts and the feelings of the spiritual consciousness. And the psyche controls the thoughts and the feelings of the material consciousness. Now, the spiritual consciousness is related to that little tiny spark of energy that's located in your superior colliculus. Superior colliculus is a part of the midbrain. It controls our thoughts. It controls our um, our eye movements. And your spirit form... One of Billy's contacts described it this way. She said that every human has a spirit. And the spirit does not die. It does not sleep. It records all of our thoughts and impulses. And it's the bearer of the creative realm. The the spirit form is the wonder of all wonders. It never dies. It's the real you, you know. Your physical, material consciousness can go insane, can go completely insane and can become totally defective and worthless. And one of the things the spiritual teaching is working to do is to keep you from doing that, to give you the knowledge so you don't fall into these uncontrolled thoughts, which can destroy you. You know, your uncontrolled, repeating thoughts, which go over and over and over and over again, can destroy your psyche. They can destroy your whole personality. They can drive you to insanity. So the spiritual teaching is all about remaining neutral about everything neutral positive about everything. So no matter how insane and how crazy and difficult the circumstances that you feel, it is important that you stay neutral. Because out of neutral positive, the neutral positive nature is your strength your real strength. Because that's where the thoughts have the tremendous power, the incredible power. It requires you to be neutral. But the the human being, unfortunately, many times, we're not satisfied with what we have. People want to be thinner, more muscular. And that doesn't mean you can't work towards becoming thinner, more muscular, You can work towards these things, but the problem is people, they get overwhelmed with self-doubt. 
which leads to failure, people become plagued by inner conflicts. And and when you're plagued by inner conflicts, you senselessly squander your energy. You lose your initiative. Look for the smaller successes. Indeed, look for all successes. And pull yourselves together. Don't become tired of yourself. If you become tired of yourself, then you can drift into despair. And at that point, people will start to literally get on their own nerves. They're tired of their own illogic. They're tired of their own stupidity. This is not a good place to be. People can become dried out and empty at this point. A complete problem can be formed because of the lack of initiative. You know, sometimes we get into situations in life where, and they really shouldn't be this way. You know, you, you look at something, you're thinking, oh man, now how can one person overcome all of that? Well, you can't even think that way. You just have to go out and do step by step what you can on a daily basis. And do not become tired of yourself, do not become do not fall into the dangerous abyss of despair. Do not become bored with yourself. Do not let yourself become dried out and empty feeling. Do not let yourself become unsatisfied. Unsatisfied means that you're discontent, you have displeasure, um, you can have disappointment. Don't allow that to happen. Unsatisfaction can be devastating and destructive. And it doesn't lead towards your goals. Now that doesn't mean you have to be an unrealistically positive thinker. Uh, that also <laughs> leads to a state of unbalance. Unsatisfaction will lead you into a state of not liking yourself. Unsatisfaction will not give you a balance in your personality. You need to maintain a balance in your personality. And because the universal consciousness is balanced. What is the universal consciousness? Well, the Meyer information says some very controversial things. It explains that there is a universal consciousness, but that doesn't correspond to the religious notions that we have about God. The universe, the creation, the creational universal consciousness, these are all synonyms. You could think of the creation as the consciousness. It doesn't work as our human consciousness. It's a purely spiritual energy. It works in a spiritual, energetic way. It's always balanced. It's neither good nor evil. It's only slightly trends towards the good. Our universe has a tremendous amount of physical space associated with it. And there's stars and there's galaxies and there's planets and there's different space configurations, but you could think of throughout the whole thing is this gigantic universal consciousness that's neither good nor evil, that's focused on evolution. That's why it creates human spirit forms to help it with its own evolution. The purpose of your life is to gain wisdom. And by doing so, you'll evolve your consciousness. Evolution is the whole point of the, the, the universal consciousness. The creation is infinite beauty. It's a beauty above all beauty. And whenever we see anything, we should trace it back to the beauty of creation itself. Whenever we see something beautiful, whether it's a flower or an animal or a human being or anything else, 
we should bring that into association with the infinite beauty of creation. The human being can trace all of his joy back to the infinite beauty of creation. All the beauty of nature can be related back to the beauty of creation. Every time the human being sees cognition reach expression, he can relate that back to the cognition of creation. And creation exists in every human being as a fragment of itself, like a fractal. Your spirit form is a fractal. It has the same pattern of all of creation. And when you have a knowledge of creation, it can lead and help towards inner peace. It can help you deal with, uh, um, can give you security. It can help by getting rid of wrong feelings. You know, the the spirit form can tell you when your thinking is right or wrong if you've learned to pay attention to it. Now, you have to turn in inward to do that. Do you know the truth? Everyone can recognize truth. Truth comes from your innermost contemplations, your innermost thoughts, and your innermost feelings. The more your intelligence becomes effective, the more you learn about creation, the more blessed you will be in your life and in your work. The incredible splendor of nature is the visible expression of the love of creation. Creation radiates love. And from the universe come these impulses. And if you're sensitive enough and you go out and you look up at a beautiful starry sky at night, you can, what's called empfinden in the German, and you can feel the radiating impulses that come from creation. And that's why you have that sense of awe and that sense of wonder. Because your spirit form is in tune with the universal consciousness. And if you turn inward, you can sense that radiating love. And here's the problem. Because our population is raging, 77 to 100 million people, every year are added to the world's population. And that means that we're going to destroy the beautiful forests to build more homes. And when we do that, we have less and less and less to remind us of the infinite love of creation, which connects all life. The infinite love of creation connects all life. Because in all life, that love lies hidden. And that's why it's so important to control your thoughts, to let yourself be influenced by the radiating love of creation. Creation is absolute certainty. And when you have a clarity of consciousness that will produce a fine sensitive feeling which will rule the human being that lives for the spirit. The creation can take possession of your consciousness in such a way that your thinking can be full of peace and happiness and strength. Now we're told in Contact Report 18, not to have the influences that come from the material intellect, such as egoism, materialism, pride, envy, greed, jealousy. This only guarantees unsatisfaction. Don't let yourself be driven by the old nature of the material intellectual thinking because that leads to unlogic. You 
you know, we get information from our our previous personalities. And we need to be sensitive to the impulses that come from the previous personality. Here's an interesting passage from the Goblet of Truth. Section 9, it says, And if you are not prepared with good knowledge in the teaching of the truth, the teaching of the Spirit and the teaching of life, then do not decide to set forth to spread the teaching of truth, but be averse to this, for without sufficient knowledge you can do more harm than good. You should stay home with other sedentary ones if you are not sufficiently skillful in the teachings. So, just be aware that also people who are unknowing are unknowing because they wish to be unknowing. Now think about that. Okay. That's some interesting information from the Meyer uh, spiritual teachings. And the spiritual teachings are are incredibly important to help us deal with practical problems in real life. You know, all of the Meyer information is is very, very valuable. And it also can help you with understanding things that are what you might call public um, public ununderstandings. We in our society have a massive quantity of ununderstanding, and we have notions that are incorrect, completely incorrect, but they're considered to be common knowledge. So that's how confused we are. Let me talk a little bit about the moon. And the moon is it's in synchronous rotation with the earth. That means it's always showing the same face to us in the night sky. The moon's distance is actually the moon is actually moving out of orbit. That should give you a little feeling of of, of insecurity, I, I imagine. About one point five inches per year. And the distance between the Earth and the Moon, they're not consistent. It's not consistent because there's a kind of a wobbling that's going on because of all the nuclear testing that's gone on over many, many, many years. And the Moon is not our original Moon. The current Moon is older than the Earth. Let me repeat that again. The current Moon is older than the Earth, and it was brought here. The Moon is a fragment of a planet from an entirely different star system, and it is four to five million years older than the Earth. The origin of the Moon has been described in detail. Now, I've talked a little bit before about the Moon landings, and the Moon landings explain to us that Apollo 11 was actually a hoax. And that the astronauts in Apollo 13 went to the same location as Apollo 11 was supposed to go. Let me read what Quetzal says in Contact 201 about the moon landings. And this is, again, another misconception of our whole society. Quetzal says, As we have already explained several times, the American Apollo 11 moon landing on July 20th 1969 did not take place because everything was a great design swindle through which the entire world has been fooled. And there were precisely 37 people who knew about the hoax, and there have been people killed in order to keep the whole thing a secret. And the moon landing is connected to murder. It's connected to Arranged accidents, arranged illnesses, fatal consequences. People uh, have been hypnotically bound to these moon landing lies. The moon rover and the landing devices that remain on the moon were brought there during later landings. 
And the whole purpose of the moon landings were to trump the Soviet Union's so-called space race. So, again, this is one of the lies that our um, whole world lives under. Now, if you're a person that's speaking truth in a world of lies, it causes a lot of anger and rage from people. And that's where we get the attempts on Billy's life there. As of Contact 471, Billy had 22 attempts on his life. I think he's had more by this time. One of the people that attacked Billy were called the Men in Black. And the Men in Black are from three groups that are operating. Government agents, secret neo-Nazi groups, and old Syrians. These old Syrians are from a different time and space configuration. However, they traveled to their to the soul system and they had a headquarters on Mars for a while. Unfortunately for us, the, the lawful Syrians, after they rounded up the, the men in black, removed all the artifacts associated with human settlements on Mars. In fact, the Syrians destroyed all the evidence that there was a civilization on Mars. This is a very unfortunate situation. And, and, and at least in my my humble opinion. I wanted to talk a little bit about overpopulation. I started to talk about that a little bit earlier, and I know this is a very controversial topic, and that most people in the alternative movement really consider um, they, they consider overpopulation only in terms of space. And they think, oh, there's plenty of space on the earth. Therefore, there could not be any overpopulation. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. You see, humans always go towards the places that are desirable to live with a good temperature and arable land and good fresh water. And this also leads to the places where the forests are. So the forests are dwindling, 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 and the cities are growing and growing and growing. And as we do that, we reduce all the positive things that forests bring with them. Positive things like the moderation of the weather. You see, that's why weather is becoming more and more extreme. Because the forests are going away, dwindling, 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 and the cities are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the forests do amazing things. They soak up all the excess, much of the excess water. They cut down on Erosion. That's why you see these incredible floods everywhere, like particularly in St. Louis right now, all these incredible floods. If we had all the all these forests and all those trees back, these floods would not be so severe. You see, the forests moderate the weather. And the winds, they slow these strong winds down. You know when these winds shoot over the plains? Because there's no forest there anymore. Because we went over there and we chopped down all the forest to grow corn, for heaven's sake, because of this tremendous population. Do you know that there are 9,000 newborns per hour over the number of deaths, between 77 and 100 million people born annually? Four to five million people die on the street in India every year. And the United States is the third fastest growing population in the world because of immigration. Have you seen all the problems occurring in the world because of immigration? These people, these Islamic and Muslim people, moving out of Syria, moving out of Afghanistan, moving out of Iraq, and coming into Europe, a culture that completely clashes with the European culture. And what happens? One of the things that's happening all over is the incredible raping. Women are being raped by these people that are entrenched in their thinking in this Islamic fundamentalism. So we have people coming into our country that have a completely different mindset than the current population. And this leads to a horrible kind of conflict. Do you know Islamic leaders do not allow birth control? And this is why the Meyer material, one of the reasons that the Meyer material rages against religion. 
again, a few more points about overpopulation. America will add 100 million people by 2035 because of immigration. Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona, and California don't possess enough, possess enough water for their residents. And the largest user of water is agriculture. One of our giant aquifers is located in the Great Plains in the United States. It's called the Ogallala. It's, it's underneath South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Texas. And the depletion of this shallow water table aquifer is increasing more and more and more. Its current average depth is only 80 feet, and it used to be something like 240 feet. Very shortly, it will become completely uneconomical to farm in the United States in that area. That's in South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas. We've had giant traffic jams across the world. Have you noticed that in the winter like this, we have these gigantic wrecks? Because you have all of these cars moving all of these people. And you get a wreck in the front and 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, sometimes 100 cars will pile up in a giant wreck and clog up the highway. In China, we've had other Wrecks in China in 2010. There was a tremendous traffic traffic jam that lasted for 10 days, and people were only able to move their cars like 0.6 miles per day. And it was just because of too many cars. You know, today because we live so far from the earth. Most people don't grow any food for themselves. And you can really grow a fair amount of food. Uh, I have six raised beds. And, um, you know, it doesn't grow all of our food, but it grows a good portion of our food. Uh, If you grow potatoes and sweet potatoes, it has a lot of food value. And um, you can grow tomatoes and cucumbers and strawberries and all, all, all things like that. So we have to get back to a different way of life. And, you know, we need to protect our forests, the oxygen-rich rainforests that regulate the climate, the clearing and burning of these rainforests for land and farming is a very destructive process. Okay, enough about overpopulation. I want to talk a little bit more about the spiritual teachings and the creation and the the success, the the way out of all this. And it's the, the biggest problem facing Earth humanity is the fact that they don't understand the creation. And Billy's first teacher was a man named Spock. And Sloth would land in Switzerland in his ship when Billy was a young boy in the 40s, 50s. And he would teach Billy face-to-face. Sloth was about a thousand-year-old man. He was from a race of beings that uh, originally allowed themselves to be called the Pleiadians. But they're not from our Pleiades. They're from a world called Era in a constellation in a star system they call the Polaris star system, which is not even in our space-time configuration. It's kind of like another dimension. And it's some 80 light years beyond our Pleiades. Our Pleiades are about 400 light years away. They contain young blue stars, which really don't support life on any planets. But for years, the Native Americans and other people on Earth called these people the Pleiadians. But they, in 1995, when they left the Earth, they revealed their true identity as the Playar. And they had at that time base in Switzerland, which was over three centuries old. They had a base in North America. They had a base in Asia. 
along with people from the Lyra Vega system and from nearby star systems. About 2,800, something like that, roughly, extraterrestrial humans that would walk among us. There was also a base um, in Mount Shasta, I believe, in Washington State, where a people called the Hyperboreans lived. The Hyperboreans were a race of people that had been here for like 136,000 years. They lived underground in this base, and you could see their golden color spherical spacecraft coming out of the, I believe, the eastern side of, of Mount Shasta. They were from, um, originally from Hyperborea. Hyperborea is a term which refers to our North Pole region. Now, the confusing part of this was our Florida was at, at the North Pole area in ancient time. That was before the shift of the Earth. This was in ancient times before the fall of Atlantis and Lemuria. Hyperborea, i.e. Florida, was at that time the North Pole area. And there was a man named Eris the Barbarian who came there. He had returned from the Earth, or from Beta Centauri, and came back to the Earth. And he conquered Hyperborea. Now, Beta Centauri shouldn't be confused with Alpha Centauri B. Alpha, Alpha Centauri is a trinary star system that's very close to Earth, about 4.37 light years. Alpha Centauri is the closest star system to the Earth. It contains Alpha Centauri A, Alpha Centauri B, Alpha Centauri C. Now, Alpha Centauri C is a small, faint, red dwarf star that is sometimes called Proxima Centauri. Beta Centauri, in contrast to Alpha Centauri, is about 350 light years from Earth, quite a long distance. Beta Centauri is where Eris the Barbarian came from. Now, in the Arabic... Beta Centauri is referred to as the name Hadar. And it is interesting that Hadar comes from the Arab, Arabic root meaning, which is to be present, to be on the ground, or settled, civilized. Why would ancient people refer to a star using a term that meant on the ground unless the visitors actually came from there? So Florida was located in these northern regions before the pole shift. There was a great pole shift during the time of Atlantis and Lemuria when the Lemurians brought back that giant asteroid and slammed it into the Earth. The area in and around Florida was located in the far north in ancient times and it was called Hyperborea. And the forces of Eris conquered Hyperborean ancient times. Now, Eris the Barbarian led, he was the father of this long lineage of people that after the fall of Atlantis left the earth, they came back. And you can, his distant descendant, Eris the 11th, was on the earth after the fall of Atlantis and the Maria. He headed up to Giza Intelligences. And the Giza intelligences were this extraterrestrial group that went far below the Giza Plateau and lived in these old cubicle constructions about 73,000 years ago. 70, excuse me, 73,000-year-old cubicle constructions. The Giza intelligences were on the Earth all the way up to the late 70s. And they were influencing the thoughts of our leaders, one of which was Hitler. Now, Hitler was very much influenced by a man named Eric or Hermann Steinschneider. Hermann Steinschneider was related to the, the Thule Society, the Thule Society, as it's called. And Hermann Steinschneider is the guy that really threw Hitler off on the wrong track. Because originally, the 
Playarin were impulsing Hitler because he had great potential as a leader. And he would have been a good leader, uh, uh, a leader that would have brought unity to the earth in many ways. He would have been very, very beneficial. But he got pushed off into this great delusion for power. And through Eric or Hermann Steinschneider and the Giza intelligences, who were in contact with the Thule Society in some way, influenced Hitler down the wrong path. And that's how we ended up with World War II. We ended up with, um, it probably is what ultimately resulted in our moon hoax. Many of the lies of today are related to the impulsations of these extraterrestrial humans who are far below the Giza Plateau, who bombarded our thinking with religious notions. And these religious notions were designed to make us lose initiative, to make us look for some outside source for our guidance, rather than looking inward for guidance. Truth is determined by your innermost thoughts, your innermost feelings, your innermost contemplations. You do not have to get truth from someone else. You need to have independent thinking on your own part to think independently. Well, it doesn't mean you can't listen to good advice. It doesn't mean that you can't get in good information from elsewhere. But you have to be the master of your own life. You are the master of your own destiny. You control your own life. Your thinking is incredibly powerful. Good thinking leads to good feelings, which leads to good habits, which leads to good circumstances in your life. If you develop those good habits, you will be successful. It's a matter of controlling your thinking. Do not fall into the trap of brooding. Do not fall into the trap of unsatisfaction. Always analyze your thinking and make sure that you're neutral. You're neutral. Nature produces a neutral energy. You know, a lot of our electricity produces a very positive energy. We need a neutral kind of negative almost energy. And it's so critical to be influenced by creation, not the religions of the earth, because the religions of the earth have very much interrupted our spiritual growth. You know, there is a storage bank archive of the general spiritual teaching. It's called the Srutal. And an archive is a place where public records or historical documents are kept. In general, archives consist of records that have been selected for permanent or long-term preservation. Our universe has records that have been selected for permanent and long-term preservation. Do you know that Billy pulled the first 14 chapters out of the terrestrial storage banks? He has the ability to do that. The first 14 chapters of the Goblet of Truth came from the storage banks called Speicherbank in German. And Figu Bulletin number 43 talks a little bit about this. Sometimes called the chalice of truth, the goblet of truth is a total work which includes the statements of Billy and his six, his six preceding prophet personalities. Billy somehow wrote this book in only four and a half months. And the reason for expiting the work because is the fact that Billy's heart is seriously weakened. And he wanted to be certain that he could still complete that book. 
the book was essentially planned for 10 years from now. And he produced it very quickly. And the actual old teaching of the prophets, the Chalice of Truth, comprises 14 sections which Nocodamian had already established in the storage bank. So who is Nocodamian? Nocodamian is the human being that originally bore the spirit form that Billy Meyer bears today, the spirit form that in his superior colliculus is a spirit that the extraterrestrial humans refer to as Nocodamian. Now, this spirit form has incarnated as the prophets today that we call Enoch, Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Emmanuel, and Muhammad. Now, these prophets had different names in in the past. They were identified, particularly Enoch was called Hanok. And Hanok wrote what we call today the Book of Enoch, but the Book of Enoch has been seriously distorted from the way it used to be. There were three personalities incarnated with the name Hanok that all played a, a role in the teachings of the Spirit. There was a Hanok 13,500 years ago, a Hanok 8,900 years ago, and a Hanok about 4,500 years ago. And they taught the teaching of the Spirit, which talks about the creation, the universal consciousness, which I mentioned earlier, the human spirit form, which I mentioned earlier, and reincarnation. Now, there's a there's a beautiful passage in the Goblet of Truth that's entitled What the Truth Knows to Say. And it says that rivers, stones, plants, seas, brooks, Bushes, trees, everything that crawls and flies on the earth is a spirit form with a life form. And these spirit forms are on a journey through time which involve many, many lifetimes. And that death is just the transfer into the world of pure spirit. And many of these creatures are connected by psychic vibrations. These psychic swinging waves these electromagnetic waves. And if you watch the birds as they fly as a flock and they move in unison, they do so because all of their spirit forms are connected by the psychic swinging waves, the Schwingen in German. And we also have influence from the psychic swinging waves from the Gemot, the controlling factor in your spirit form. And this is our connection with the universal consciousness, with the superintelligence that runs all things. And we all have a purpose in this universe, is to evolve our consciousness. And you evolve your consciousness slowly, bit by bit, by learning about the universal consciousness, and by learning how to control your thinking and by learning how to utilize the tremendous power of your own thinking. Now, what did Ptah say, one of Billy's contacts? Ptah is the commander of the Great Mothership. What did he say about the book, The Goblet of Truth? Ptah said, you have therefore required only just around four and a half months for that while we... However, reckon on three to four years. When Billy wrote this book, he did in three or four months rather than three or four years. And Ta or Ta said, "This is an astonish, astonishing achievement, which results from your tirelessness and your industriousness. But with you, I have, from my side, already often struggled with my astonishment and asked myself how you complete everything." And Billy says. So said to Ta, please do not embarrass me because I'm only fulfilling my duty and I try to do the best that I can to fulfill my duty. So, 
it was a tremendous accomplishment. It's one of the books that you can download for free called The Goblet of Truth. If you Google The Goblet of Truth, you'll find one of the many websites where there's probably you should only go to the uh, to the Figo site, but um, if you go to Google and you enter in Goblet of Truth, and it's not an easy book to read, let me tell you. You go to you at the very first thing that comes up is a link that goes to the Figo site, and you can download the Goblet of Truth and start to read this incredible information for yourself. And it's a long read. It's not an easy read. It's one of the harder books uh, Billy's to read. I want to just thank all of the folks that listen to this archive. Uh, we'll try to do more shows on the Meyer material. I've been on the Revolution Radio Show talking about the Meyer material uh, a fair good deal. Google Ohio Exopolitics because the website exopoliticsohio.us is where a lot of the information related to this radio show is stored. I thank you for coming to the show and listening to the archive. Have a good evening. We'll see you on our blue show.